Now I want to really talk about uh, where Aristotelianism comes into its own. All right. Um, so in this later part of the, the outline, now we're getting into the time of the, the Crusades. So definitely there is cross-cultural contact between Europe and the Middle East. And, um, you know, these, these authors are starting to have an impact. And, and of course, um, one thing that, that's really important here is that Al-Andalus in modern day Spain, that is part of the Caliphate uh, Islamic Empire, um, as Muslims made their way across Northern Africa and then up into modern day Spain, Al-Andalus as they called it, uh, you know, they're developing universities in Cordoba especially, and those universities become the model of the model for European universities. And so European universities is just about to happen, and Al-Andalus Al is considered part of this whole university explosion. Um, because in the not too distant future, um, the caliphate is going to recede away uh, from, from modern day Spain. And then the Spanish empire is going to emerge out of that. Uh, and of course, Christopher Columbus that we've been thinking about, um, he is working on behalf of the Spanish empire. Okay. So Avicenna uh, is a Persian and uh, heavily influenced by Al-Farabi. And so his ideas are very similar, okay? Um, but he does work on something that's uh, kind of interesting and something that kind of has made its way into philosophical thinking uh, even to this day, even in the 20th century, these questions have, have been uh, very prevalent, the difference between essence and existence. Um, and so Avicenna wanted to emphasize that existence, you know, the actuality, concrete existence, um, actually existing, an actually existing human being lives in a world of contingency. <coughs> and that existence is accidental, <coughs> meaning that the human being just takes on uh, accidental characteristics, things that are, of course, um, consistent with the nature of a human being, but aren't purely determined. You know, there's lots of variability in the human life, and the actual real realized human being um, only realizes part of the overall potential. And so uh, it's the essence that it endures, uh, you know, in, uh, in a substance beyond the accidental uh, actuality, concrete existence. Uh, and that essence still contains all the human potentiality. Okay, so that's like um, kind of interesting way of thinking about things. And, and, um, and I've put it very much in this potentiality versus actuality to tie it together with Aristotle from, from before. And thinking in terms of the human's existence versus essence is very important for the way that modern philosophy developed and, and these issues that persist to today. Okay. Um, and he argued, and this is very interesting, that existence cannot be deduced from essence just because uh, a substance having matter and form, an actual real existing thing, just because it has a certain essence, potentiality, doesn't mean that it, uh, that potentiality actually exists. And essence here also is like concept, just because you have a concept of something and within the concept 
uh, it has you have some notion of perfection or, or you know these kind of Aristotelian ways of thinking that doesn't mean that because you suppose this concept to be perfect that it really exists and of course what's in the background here is God you can't just think well God is such and such and because in concept the way that I think about God God is of a certain concept that therefore God exists okay, but this is what people often you know this is obviously something that he's arguing against that exists uh, you know within uh, Arabic philosophy and theology at the time uh, and we'll see an example of this uh, later on. So this, this uh, existence cannot be deduced from essence is, is uh, very important for our story of modernity. Uh, now, then he also further argued uh, that uh, the cause of the existence of a substance must exist. Okay, so now here is where this is where he's now going to prove the existence of God in a very Aristotelian way. Um, okay, it's not just that the concept of God determines that God must exist, but when anything causes anything, the thing that is the cause of a real existing thing, it must exist. Right? The gingerbread. If we think of the material cause of the gingerbread, if the gingerbread exists, then the sugar and the flour and the eggs and, and the water and all that, that, that has to exist. You can't have a cause of a, of a real existing thing that is not something that itself exists. Okay. Uh, therefore, a necessary existent exists. There is something that necessarily exists. There has to be some cause. So this is kind of a rendition of the prime mover argument. Um, but you see that it's, you know, he, Avicenna has taken it, he, he's put his own spin on it. Uh, and, and as I said, this existence versus essence distinction is something that is really caught on it. Somehow it, it makes a lot of sense for philosophers. Um, and so this necessary existence, that thing that needs to be kind of the, the ground floor of everything, uh, uh, he also proves that that is not multiple. It's only one thing because he defines the necessary existence in such a way that if there were two of them, they would have exactly the same properties, exactly the same qualities. You would describe them exactly the same, and if you describe them the same, then they are the same. If there's no difference between them, then they're the same, in a common sense kind of way. But Aristotle um, used similar arguments. So then the necessary existent is God. So this is how he proves the existence of God in a very Aristotelian way. Very interesting. Um, and, you know, for people that are steeped in Aristotelianism and find Aristotle very compelling in, in lots of different ways, uh, that's a pretty uh, convincing argument. Okay, it looks like my daughter is home. So I'm going to break off here uh, just so I don't have a lot of mayhem going on. Okay, I'll see you next time.